Okay, our third speaker in this panel, uh, one well known to this program, Ken Clooney, has been here twice before to teach us about lupus. And again, we've asked him to come today. Uh, Ken comes from UCSD in California. He's going to talk about the approach to lupus nephritis. Ken. Thanks, Jack. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to uh, try to summarize uh, what um, lupus nephritis looks like in uh, 2023 and beyond. A lot of it, you've got to give me a little bit of slack because a lot, a lot of it is uh, developmental dot and uh, and preliminary studies. But uh, I'll try to do. Thank you. I'll try to do my best here. These are my disclosures. So we're waiting um, for gui upcoming guidelines from several organizations, but um, what I've done here is I've taken some guidelines from the past and and combine them with some experiences that I've had in, develop in our joint um, multidisciplinary uh, lupus nephritis clinic that um, I run with a nephrologist um, at UC San Diego. Um, and it's a model that many people have adopted. We are um, not the first to do it, um, but I think that there are about seven around the country, last time I checked. Um, and these are sort of guidelines that um, Aren't things that I necessarily did before I, um, you know, started this multidisciplinary clinic, but I think they're important aspects to consider. First is ACE and ARP directed therapies are sh should probably be recommended for patients with signs of renal involvement to control blood pressure, to reduce UPCR to the lowest possible levels, and to uh, decrease the risk of acute renal uh, disease related um, uh, morbidity later in life. Also, secondly, hydroxychloroquine is something that when I was training um, in lupus at UCLA, I, I was told basically that I could stop Plaquenil. Um, this was a long time ago because what I was using to treat lupus nephritis would be good enough to treat the other aspects of disease. But there's a lot of, a lot of things that uh, um, Lauren uh, pointed out I'd be missing, right? Um, and, uh, and there's data to back that up. Uh, the Lumina trial, uh, or the cohort actually, um, showed that Plaquenil reduces the likelihood of developing end stage renal disease and proteinuria and EGFRs um, less than 50 um, mLs per minute over time. So that's an important aspect to remember. And, um, the third bullet is that we, our clinical tr um, trial development programs have led to, you know, some uh, strategies that we use, and we'll go over them. But basically, the problem is that we're only getting about a 20% um, complete response um, through the induction phase. But nonetheless, we are getting an 80% um, uh, response through the maintenance phase. Um, when we use corticosteroids in conjunction with, with various immunosuppressant drugs. Um, but the problem is that's really reliant on high-dose corticosteroids, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and lastly, it's um, important to realize from um, the AMP data, some of which you've heard, um, there are some important um, pathways that uh, may be ignored in the way we treat lupus nephritis now, including the role of interferon, um, the role of uh, tubular cells and podocytes, and also um, the fibrotic pathways that may be involved with lupus nephritis. And we'll learn, we've learned a lot from the AMP data. You've heard some of it, but we'll go into that a little bit more as well. Okay, so going back to ancient times in lupus nephritis treatment, um, the NIH, as many of you know, um, did the first real, true, um, well-designed uh, trial in lupus nephritis, looking at um, the role of cytoxin. Um, and um, initially, there were some you know, suggestions that there was a response, but later it turned out that it really took four to five years of follow-up to see a real good benefit. Also, at around that time, um, IV cytoxin, was, and I think data was shown yesterday uh, about that, um, was as effective as oral cytoxin um, with lower cumulative doses. That, that was shown in, um, in vasculitis, but it, it's true also in lupus nephritis. Um, and obviously, IV cytoxin has uh, fewer side effects. And then more, more recently, but not quite re all that recent, uh, came the Euro lupus um, uh, study, which looked at 500 milligrams um, IV 
biweekly for six doses. So a, a very shorter induction phase. Um, and that was shown to be um, as um, effective as the NIH protocol. And in fact, that's what we're using. Just to give you my own personal perspective, I had I'd only given cytoxid for lupus nephritis in um, up until about two years ago. Um, once a year, and now I'm using lupus relatively frequently. So um, then, as you all know, mycophenolate mofetil um, came on the on the scene, and it in the studies, and I'm not going to go into them, but they showed similar efficacy of cytoxin with similar adverse event rates, but the severity of the adverse events were less severe. It's really more popular with patients who are spared hair loss and um, bone marrow toxicity, which is seen with cytoxin. There's good efficacy in inducing remission in the short term in several populations, including adolescents and uh, patients with severe initial disease and EGFRs less than 30. There's a shorter time to relapse, but a higher relapse rate in the long term. And it's really the preferred um, way to treat um, patients in induction um, who have mild or relapsing disease, who are black, who are Asians, and in patients with fertility um, issues or patients who failed cytoxin or who are approaching the long-term cumul cumulative dosage of, of cytoxin that we as associate with bad outcomes from toxicities. Moving forward, looking at um, what clinical trial outcomes we should include in trials in the future, and we've begun to incorporate these um, in um, trials that I'm going to be talking about, um, are here outlined. Um, but they're, the bottom line is they're, bo they're basically based on um, a really good study that Megan Mackey at the Feinstein um, uh, published a couple of years ago with Brad Rovin and and uh, Maria Delara and, uh, and myself. And we looked at a bunch of cohorts of lupus patients um, from different sources. Uh, we looked at cohorts and also clinical trials. We looked at different populations um, focusing on multiple continents. And we found that the best predictor of long-term outcome was really a urine protein creatinine ratio less than 0.5 or 500 milligrams in 24 hours. And that sort of changed the ballpark. We were looking really at cells a lot, you know, looking at hematuria um, and other aspects, but it's really the, um, the uh, urine protein creatinine ratio or the 24-hour urine protein of less than uh, 500 milligrams that, that really seems to be important. And so a lot of the data you see down the primary endpoint really focuses on that endpoint. There was some talk in, before we actually did these studies of whether um, 800 milligrams or 500 milligrams was, um, was the threshold, but uh, I think recently we've come up with 500 milligrams. But the other concept is obviously you don't want to have worsening renal function, right? Right? And um, that's a problem when you're doing landmark assessments, when you're looking at a, a finite point in time, um, because there can be lots of fluctuations in serum creatinine, and um, you know you, you could have had a bad day and be, been dehydrated or whatever. So uh, this uh, this uh, paper actually suggests that where this came from, this slide came from, suggests that. Um, that probably you need to do at least two determinants of ser serum creatinine, and it's not clear what the the um, the uh, time difference in in those uh, collections are. But uh, but those are the concepts: 500 milligrams and not just one landmark uh, serum creatinine function test. So. We're now beginning to look at combination therapies because um, we want to um, do more for our patients and. A theme of this conference really has been to look at combinations of therapies to get to that, to that, get to that goal of better outcome. So our idea is to start potentially with combination immunosuppressant therapies and steroids, potentially getting the steroid dosage initially down and then ramp down the immunosuppressants and try to get off steroids first and then maybe get off in a, the, a one of the two or whatever um, immunosuppressants you're using. So here's our first polling question. Which combination therapeutic approach has been shown to the, be the most effective in reducing proteinuria very rapidly? And those are the, uh, the options. 
just have to push this forward to get the result. Uh, here we go. Very smart audience. Wow. Very impressive. Well, that's the right answer. And we'll talk about that. Okay. All right. So um, the first attempt at, at combination therapies was to combine um, anti-CD20 and um, belibumab. And there were two trials that, that looked at these. One was the Calibrate study, one was the BEAT um, lupus trial. Calibrate was just lupus nephritis, the BEAT was lupus nephritis and lupus. So in the Calibrate study, what patients got, it was a phase 2A study, randomized open label trial, 43 patients with refractory class 3 or 4, with or without uh, membranous disease. And the regimen was to give methylprednisolone 100 milligrams and rituximab a gram plus cytoxin 750 milligrams on week 0 and 2, followed by belibumab versus no belibumab, and then the prednisone was tapered to 10 milligrams per day by week 12. So pretty aggressive tapering of prednisone. So the first uh, lupus nephritis trial that was that aggressive. And the primary endpoint was safety. The efficacy endpoints that were looked at were complete response and overall response at weeks 24, 48, and 96. In the BEAT study, again, lupus nephritis and non-nephritis, Phase 2B, randomized controlled trial, placebo-controlled, 52 patients with refractory lupus or lupus nephritis. And the regimen was rituximab, a gram at weeks 0 and 2, followed by IV belibumab or placebo, um, starting at weeks um, 4 to 8 with concomitant um, um, uh, um, immunosuppressants allowed. And um, the... Um, there was no mandated prednisone taper, but uh, they were um, allowed to get to less than uh, 20 milligrams. Um, so the primary endpoint was a serum immunoglot um, IgG and a double-stranded DNA at week 52, and the secondary outcome was really time to first moderate disease flare or severe disease flare. And these are the calibrate data. Basically, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but it did, there's no advantage to, um, to um, the, uh, the, um, the hypothesized uh, treatment. Um, but what we did see was that um, the, re the regimen diminished uh, maturation of transitional to naive B cells during B cell reconstitution, which was seen in both groups. However, the um, combination um, rituximab um, and uh, cytoxin and belibumab um, group actually had more enhanced um, uh, inhibition of the emergence of, um, of autoreactive B cells with repopulation. In the beet lupus trial, um, basically we saw that, um, that there was a reduction in reduced IgG and a double-stranded DNA antibody levels, and also um, a reduced risk for um, severe flare in patients with lupus that have been refractory to conventional therapy. And there really wasn't enough to separate whether or not there was an individual effect for lupus nephritis versus non-nephritis, but there was a suggestion that perhaps that worked. And that's just really as far as we've gone. The next trial that that uh, was um, that instituted combination therapy was one that um, Dr. Fury um, hinted to. He actually was the first author on it, and it was a phase three trial of belibumab in patients with active uh, lupus nephritis. Now, I, I assumed he was going to talk about this, so I left that for him. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it, but um, what what happened here was patients with uh, lupus and biopsy proven class three, four, and or five were randomized one to one to monthly belibumab, 10 milligrams per kilogram IV, or placebo, plus standard of care. And that standard of care could have been either cytoxin or MMF in the standard doses that we use. And basically, the primary endpoint, which is um, a um, combination endpoint, what showed be um, uh, benefit for uh, belibumab, with belibumab. And all the secondary endpoints listed here were, um, were hit. And so the bottom line is, you can definitely do this. This is add-on therapy. Most of the patients were in the maintenance phase and were either chronically active or they were flaring in the maintenance phase. But there were some patients who were in the induction phase and not doing well. Instead of 
switching over to rituximab, which often you do in the induction phase when you don't get a response and you don't want to go to the other drug, like going from cytoxin to bulib to, uh, to, um, uh, to bulimab or bulimab to cy cytoxin. Um, they did that. And, and basically, we saw good results in both of those groups. Um, and then, at the, basically, at the same time, there was a lot of interest in vulcosporin, which at the time was uh, several years ago, was a relatively new calcineuric inhibitor. Um, it's a structural analog of cyclosporin A with an additional uh, single carbon extension with a double bond on one side chain with much better um, binding efficacy for uh, uh, the binding efficacy of cyclosporin. Um, our vocalsporin and cyclosporin A for cyclophilin are comparable, but upon binding that side chain of vocalsporin, there's an induction of structural change uh, to calcineurin that uh, res may result in increased immunosuppression. So um, basically, as you know, calcineuric inhibitors um, can um, reduce proteinuria, but also they affect podocytes, which is something that we don't do with our standard of care in what we've done in the past. So the Aurora 1 study looked at combining vulcosporin with MMF, not with cytoxin, with low-dose steroids, and that led to um, clinically and statistically superior complete renal response versus MMF and low-dose um, steroids alone with um, a comparable uh, safety profile. And this is this slide's important. It's really, this kind of changed the way I actually treat patients with lupus nephritis. They used a starting dose of uh, 20 to 25 milligrams compared to the 50 to 100 that I was doing before and rapidly tapered by uh, week 16 to 2.5. So how's that changed my standard of care? I use a lot less. I use 40 milligrams in induction and try to, my best to get um, down at, by week 16 to uh, 5 milligrams or less. And you can see its efficacy here compared to um, the standard of care. Again, this is add-on uh, data. Um, so these mostly were patients who were not doing well in the maintenance phase, but we're beginning to think that we can use this in the induction phase. Um, really quickly, um, we looked at the um, long-term um, safety data um, in uh, over three years with the, the study I just showed, as well as the, um, the uh, tag-on study, which took um, patients two, three years, and the safety was, was, uh, was quite good in terms of serious adverse events and, um, and reductions in UPCR were uh, achieved and maintained. So that was very, um, very impressive. Um, and then we also looked at the, the um, long-term safety and efficacy in Hispanic and Latino uh, patients with lupus nephritis. And basically, we found, actually, that these patients had very good efficacy, but a real interesting finding was they got proteinuric um, di uh, diminished proteinuria at a remarkably short period of time. And that was, again, um, validated in another study here that showed that you could get a proteinuric um, level less than 500 milligrams very rapidly. Um, and um, that was true in the different classes of disease, membranous, proliferative, and, uh, and uh, combined with, um, with um, one, both disease, uh, both um, uh, types of disease. So what are the un unmet needs? We um, need better diagnostic biomarkers, we need biomarkers of response, and we need treatment, uh, um, uh, treatment uh, approaches that um, show increased rates of complete response. So here's the, the second and last polling question. Which, which novel approach has evidence-based uh, promise in lupus nephritis? Right, all of them. Great, you guys are so smart, you didn't need me here today. Okay, I don't have much time left, but I'm gonna go through this really, really quickly, and maybe go over by a minute or two, if that's okay. Um, so um, this um, study at the last ACR looked at auto, um, autoantibody trajectories associated with classification and treatment response in lupus nephritis, and we can see that there um, were basically um, uh, they showed that levels of autoantibodies against double-stranded DNA, C1Q, chromatin, and ribosomal P may serve as non-invasive biomarkers of proliferative um, lupus nephritis. And this is from the AMP data set. 
And um, also, um, we uh, we uh, we showed in the, from the AMP data set that uh, proliferative disease is associated with type one interferons, and that um, several uh, serum immune mediators. Uh, correlated with an, um, intrarenal lupus uh, nephritis activity with um, CD136 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and TNF-R2 um, exhibiting the highest correlations. And urinary proteinomics are really important, and this is data from AMP. Um, we found, our group found that uh, a change in urinary biomarkers at three months predicts one year treatment response of lupus nephritis better than proteinuria. proteinuria. And um, the, the um, urinary biomarkers to follow are CD163, IL-16, and, uh, and um, CD206, as uh, Rich pointed out. Um, and then also um, the the um, single cell RNA um, uh, seq data um, with urinary proteinomics kind of confirmed uh, these findings as well. I'll skip that. And um, this this Tom this is also from. Um, the AMP uh, group. Um, what this shows is that we may be able, with single cell RNA seq, be able to diagnose um, the type of lupus nephritis patients have, whether it be proliferative or membranous. So you can see that different uh, mark, uh, biomarkers um, correlate with different diseases. And this um, this article can, uh, you can you, if you're interested, you can check that out. It's um, preliminary data, but it's important. And I'm going to slip over these. So these are the preliminary uh, conclusions from the urinary uh, proteinomics, but we've pretty much hit them. Um, I just want to talk about some food for thought. Um, what about using vocalosporin for initial rapid reduction in proteinuria? Um, and because that's obviously very beneficial, but then using bilibimab for long-term preservation of GFR. Um, the idea here is that um, vocalsporin gets proteinuria down really rapidly, but may be associated with fibrosis. So in order to obviate um, that complication, maybe we should switch um, from at some point in time, whether that be when you're switching from um, induction to maintenance, switch to bilibimab, which doesn't have a proteinuric effect, I mean a, a, a fibrotic effect, and uh, see how you do. And then what about using SGLT2 inhib inhibitors to uh, further drive down the urine protein? And that's something that we, we'd like to study. Um, there are lots of drugs in, in development, um, and um, I think targeting interferons is, is key, and there are um, lots of, uh, lots of um, uh, um, drugs, and um, we, uh, we're looking at uh, depleting. PDCs or inhibiting PDCs, as well as other um, interferon pathways, toll-like receptors uh, being one. But also expanding on um, our experience with rituximab, going beyond what we saw in those, those studies, those early studies I talked about earlier, and, uh, and in the age of biosimilars, maybe incorporating them as well. But there are also opportunities um, to, uh, well, this is another um, CD20 um, uh, study from Rich Fury, he uh, published this as phase two data that was very um, promising in, in looking at uh, treating as induction. Obinutuzumab, which is basically a, a rituximab on steroids, as I like to call it, is just more potent. But we're waiting phase three um, data. Um, but we can also target um, T cells, and there are many ways to do that. We're looking at low dose IL-2, which boosts deficiencies that patients with lupus have um, in um, in uh, T regs. We're also using looking at an S1P um, uh, receptor um, uh, targeted therapy, and also looking at um, hip and affecting, and that that affects trafficking of T cells. We're also looking at um, uh, targeting CD6 and ALCAM. And that's an interesting approach because ALCAM can be used as a, um, as a biomarker of, um, of uh, potential efficacy. And um, these are our, our five-year goals. Um, as a group of, of people interested in lupus nephritis, we need better means of assessing outcome. We need more robust clinical trial designs that utilize fewer patients. We need biomarker-driven treatment approaches. And we need to develop biomarkers to predict outcome and, safe, and safety. Thank you.